So this is kind of a culmination of something I've been thinking about for a couple of years. It started with the Buddha. I was taking a course, a, a workshop on scientific writing. And one of the prompts we were given had to do with the Buddha. It was from an essay by a guy named Amitav Gosh, who wrote a book called The Nutmeg's Curse, which is a really awesome book, parables of you know, the end of the world kind of thing. But his whole book is about how colonialism and slavery and so on has led us to where we are today, which is not a good place. Um, and a lot about global warming. But in that book, there was one essay about how the Buddha and the Bodhi tree had this connection that could not be explained by science, which led to his enlightenment. And we were asked to write about our example, some example in our lives of an interaction we had with a non-human species that led to some kind of enlightenment. Well, I'm a scientist. And I said, we can probably explain how the Buddha figured out what he figured out by thinking about science, especially looking back from what we know about science today. And so the Buddha's idea was, of course, that life is cyclic. Everything is cyclic. You know, you're born, you die, you go back to the earth, and more things are born and they die and go back to the earth. So everything is cyclic. And that was really the basic premise of, of his ideas. And so as he's sitting under this Bodhi tree, which he did for 47 days or 49 days in 500 BCE, so a long time ago, he came to this realization that all life out there is cyclic. So how did the Bodhi tree communicate this? To them? This was the assumption that Amitabh Ghosh made was that the Bodhi tree communicated this. Well, I don't think the tree itself communicated with it, but, you know, 500 BCE, people were living off of the earth. They were living amongst the organisms on the planet. They were growing their own food. They were hunting and gathering. They were really connected to the life cycles. They were connected to the seasonal cycles. They were connected to all this stuff. And I'm sure when the Buddha was sitting there, he saw insects eating this tree. He saw things coming out of the tree that weren't tree, other insects that fly away from the tree and so on. And so my guess is that he, like all of the indigenous people who lived off the planet in tune with nature, understood that life is cyclic. You know, the indigenous people knew that if you harvest a bunch of stuff, you don't just keep harvesting until it's gone. You have to leave things behind and you have to return things back to it. <clears throat> they got my thinking about all this stuff. So what do we know today as scientists. We've been studying biology now, so scientific inquiry. So this started, the Buddha was 500 years BCE. Um, scientific in inquiry has been going on for about 500 years. So there's a pretty significant gap in between. But so what have we learned in the last 500 years as biologists? We've learned quite a lot, and I'm going to start with plants because I am a plant physiologist, and it all starts with plants. So this is what life is really based on on the planet right now. Um, there are some organisms out there that eat rocks, kind of. You know, they get their energy from minerals, but it's a very small number. The vast majority of plants get their energy from sunlight. The vast majority of every other animal and every other organism on the planet also gets their energy from sunlight. And it comes from this process of photosynthesis, which is a pretty remarkable process. All those plants out there that no one ever pays attention to do this when the sun is out and they have their leaves. They take carbon dioxide, water, and minerals. Those are the fertilizers that I listed there that are all diffuse in the environment. And they bring them together and they form all the stuff on the right-hand side, all the molecules that make up life. Without the plants taking all these things that are diffuse in the environment and doing that, which is a process that requires a lot of energy, not just to fix that carbon and split the water, but for things to accumulate, to organize anything, is an energy-dependent process. To put a word on a page requires energy. It doesn't matter what it is. If you organize it, it took energy to do it. And this is what plants do. They're really good at it. They're all over the planet. You find them almost every place in some form. 
algal in the water, on the land, up in the mountains, up in Alaska, in the tundras, you see plants every place. And they're all accumulating this biomass. <clears throat> that biomass then feeds pretty much everything else. So there's a lot of plants on the planet. They've been around for a long time, but they feed everything else. And I'm gonna show you an example. Why this isn't working? Really quick example of one of these situations. And so almost everybody thinks about the transformation of a caterpillar into a butterfly as something remarkable. In fact, in a lot of books, it actually says it's one of the most amazing transformations ever, is that this little ugly caterpillar goes through this process of metamorphosis and comes out as a butterfly. And it is, it's a pretty amazing transformation of life form to another life form. But what's even a more amazing transformation of a life form to another life form is what happens when a tree gets transformed into another organism completely different. So here's a monarch butterfly. That monarch butterfly is laying an egg on this leaf. There's the little egg. It's about an egg. It's about a millimeter um, tall. It's made, it's got food in there. Mom gave it food. And the shell is made out of a material that the caterpillar eats. It eats its way out of there. And when it comes out, it's really small. And then it starts eating the plant. And it eats that plant and eats the plant and eats the plant and eats the plant until it reaches a certain body size and energy content that it knows it's, it sort of knows it has the energy to do that really amazing transformation and become a butterfly. I think it's pretty amazing that a single cell inside that little capsule became a caterpillar from what was a plant just a short time before. And it became this caterpillar and it does this hook thing, attaches itself to a leaf with some web, forms a chrysalis. That chrysalis sits there for a little while and eventually there's a butterfly inside. That's the amazing transformation, right? That little butterfly will pop out and it will pump the fluid from its body into the wings, grow those wings, and this thing will fly away, find a mate, reproduce, completing its life cycle. So it's cycling through its life, but it's only cycling through that life because it took plant material, transformed it into a totally different organism than that plant was, and now is gonna do it again and again and again. Of course, the monarch's really complicated because it also migrates while it's doing all this, but we're not gonna talk about that. So photosynthesis gives us this biomass. That biomass becomes these other organisms. Whatever eats the plant becomes a different thing than the plant was, but it's using the plant material and it's using all the energy that came from sunlight to do this. Pretty simple. I told you this is gonna be pretty basic. So basic, I'm gonna show you what you learned in grade school, high school and introductory college courses, but probably haven't really thought about very much. <clears throat> You've thought about the carbon cycle because it's in the news all the time that we have this carbon cycle, which is really required for life to persist the way it does. And it's actually does what it does um, through a combination of the biological part of the world and the geological part of the world. They work together. And this is the Gaia hypothesis, basically, that the Earth is in this uh, dynamic equilibrium because of the biology on the planet. So plants do photosynthesis. They take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They respire. Some of it goes back in the atmosphere. All these organisms like the caterpillars eat the plants. They take that material away from the plant. Eventually they'll all die and they'll go back into the earth and rot and decompose. And those minerals and nutrients will become available again. The carbon dioxide will go off through respiration. The nitrogen will get back into the soil water and uh, water is out there all the time. So you have a carbon cycle. This has been going on for a long time. And for hundreds of thousands of years, that carbon dioxide has been held at check at a particular amount, around 280 parts per million to 300 parts per million. There's a nitrogen cycle, same kind of thing. Nitrogen is used by the plants to make all those proteins, amino acids, nucleic acids, all that kind of stuff. Um, when it gets eaten, that stuff gets converted into the biomass of the other organisms in the same kind of molecules and so on. And then when those things die, they go back into the soil. 
that nitrogen before us came from nitrogen fixing organisms in the soil, bacteria, um, that also associated with some plants. That nitrogen gets into the water system as ammonia gets converted into nitrates. These are things plants can actually take out of the water and use to grow not available to them otherwise, even though 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen, is completely inert in that di uh, trivalently bond N2. So you have this cycle and that nitrogen content has been pretty well in check for a long time. <clears throat> There's also a water cycle. We often forget about the water cycle, but plants play a really important role in the water cycle. You have water coming out from evapotranspiration from the plants. This really drives a lot of the weather. Um, Humboldt, back when he was studying nature, said in his writings that we are disturbing the ecosystem to the point where we're changing the climate because we're wiping out so many plants for agriculture. So that idea of humans changing the weather was not new. That's been around for a long time. So you have to have this... Um, water cycle to keep the water pure for one thing. It has to go through this evaporation thing and that leaves behind the waste products and that new water can, fresh water can come out. Now going a little more advanced, for those of you who don't remember your introductory biology classes, there are these pyramids, food pyramids. <clears throat> so this is more like you see in the senior level class in high school or maybe in introductory biology here. These food pyramids are this idea that I just talked about where the life is recycled. So we have the primary producers, the plants at the bottom, they use the light and energy, or the light energy, carbon dioxide, water, and mineral nutrients to make that biomass. That biomass gets eaten by those primary consumers as they transform the plant into whatever they are, you know, a beetle or whatever. At each step of this, you lose about 10, uh, 90% of the energy or whatever from this transformation. A lot of it gets dissipated as heat. And so you have secondary consumers that eat the primary consumers, they do the same thing. So say for example, that moth in the middle, it's eaten by some bird and it becomes a bird, part of the bird. You no longer have the moth, you now have transformed it into bird life um, and so on. Then you get up to the top and by the time you get to the top, there's not a lot of energy left in the system. Most of that energy has been dissipated. There's decomposers also dissipating things as these all die, as everything does, according to the Buddha and all the indigenous people in the world. They die and they go back and you have to return to the soil and to the atmosphere and to the environment, those primary ingredients that the primary producers work on. It's absolutely required. If you disrupt the decomposers, life will die as we know it. Tie these together, we have our more advanced food left, so interactions amongst things, but you have those three major cycles I put out there for you. They're all interacting with the food web, which is basically the ecosystem. So there's all these organisms exchanging information and energy and material substances amongst each other. And each one of them does its own thing with it, whatever their genome tells it to do. They become a butterfly, they might become a robin or a lizard. The sun, fortunately for us, is there, up in the sky someplace or out in space. And it's always providing us that photosynthetically powerful energy in the form of light. This is a given. Still with me? All right. What about at the cellular level? So here's a plant cell with some chloroplast in it. I don't remember what this one was. I, I did this a long time ago. <laughs> and this is a bunch of slimy bacteria. That's some kind of eukarya. What about them as an individual? So, you know, I've been talking about these multicellular organisms and plants and then the bigger things that get made from them. Well, these guys also are dependent on cycles and they're dependent on cycles at the molecular level. So photosynthesis requires what we call the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle is what allows the plant to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and turn it into sugars, which it then transforms into all those other things that are listed in the biomass thing. <clears throat> if you disrupt the Calvin cycle, no photosynthesis. There's one molecule, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, 
up there on the left side, RUBP, which is the molecule that carbon dioxide gets added to by the enzyme Rubisco, splits into two, three carbon sugars, and then it gets processed through the cycle. Some of it gets extra ones get put off and get turned into amino acids and so on. If you stop making RUBP, this completely stops because you can't continue a cycle if you don't have the substrate. Same thing with the cycle that every student loves, the Krebs cycle. If you don't resupply those precursors that are required for that cycle, you die. So cycles play a role. This is the Buddhist thing in every aspect of life. And there's many kinds of cycles. And this is just some of them. So from the cellular level, every bacteria, every multicellular organism, everything out there is dependent on these internal cycles. And in the bigger picture, all the cycles in terms of the ecosystems and so on. If you look at intermediary metabolism, Jason, there are cycles in there. Can you confirm that? Yeah, he, he agrees. There are cycles in there. There's always cycles. And if you mess these things up, the results can be disastrous. They could lead to diseases. They could lead to all kinds of problems. <clears throat> so I forgot to mention. So the drawings, these drawings are made by my stepdaughter, Maggie Anderson. So I... I proposed all these things to her and I said, you know, we need these pretty basic things. So I explained what I had this idea about how to depict an ecosystem of the planet. And that ecosystem of the planet, I put in this infinite loop because it has been going on for so long, it's kind of an infinite system. And among that loop are millions of little cycles of every organism doing its life cycle. And they're trading things, they're giving substrates to another one and so on, feeding each other, taking things from others and so on. Some are eating each other and turning, you know, something from one thing into some other organism. But they're in this thing that is constant. It's like this boiling mass of photosynthetic energy driving all of these reactions that are happening that keeps life going. So we have this thing, and I think it's a pretty cool depiction of, you know, what the concept is of the Gaia hypothesis and what I'm trying to get at, which is everything is interconnected. We hear this all the time, you know, the butterfly flaps its wings over here and it's felt it. another Buddhism thing. Then something happened <clears throat> in medieval times. This actually started before the medieval times. Aristotle first came up with this idea Trying to, everybody was trying to organize life and do all of this stuff and catalog everything. And they came up with this idea that there's this hierarchy of life forms. And this is the one that came out in a really clear form in the um, Middle Ages. This is the great chain of being. I don't know if you've ever seen this image or an image like this, but this great chain of being is basically that there's a God up at the top. Below that, there's some angels. And then there are humans. And then there's everything else below it, you know, animals and so on until you get down to plants, the lowest life form. They didn't know about microbes. So this whole idea, and you probably use these terms yourself, that something is a lower life form than another. I'm a plant biologist. I hear it all the time. You work on a low life form, you know, that sort of thing. Microbiologists probably hear that all the time. But what happened when this whole idea got passed around is that we separated ourselves from nature. We you can hear it today. In fact, I heard people talking about this in Iowa yesterday on the news. God put us here and is going to take care of us because we are the closest thing to God. We don't have to worry about climate change or any of those things. It'll all be taken care of. And by the way, if you ever see a paper, if you're reviewing a paper and they refer to some organism as a lower or higher life form, you should, as an editor, say, fix this. This is not science. This is religion. It's not proper to have that in your scientific paper. Some editors overrule you. I've seen that happen when I've done that. So anyway, we separate. 
I just heard a ping in my ear, sorry. Um, <clears throat> we don't belong to nature anymore. That's kind of how we've lived for quite some time now. And what are the implications of that? Well, a couple hundred years ago, we discovered, well, a long time ago, we discovered fire. Fire gave us a way to cook food. That gave us more nutrition out of the food that we were eating. And our brains got bigger and our brains got faster. We had more energy than the other organisms and we could do things the other organisms couldn't do. We became technological and we started building things out of using energy that didn't come from photosynthesis immediately. It came from photosynthesis millions of years ago in the terms of fossil fuels, coal and oil and so on. And we started building factories that could produce all kinds of things that would make our lives better. Everything, you hear this all the time. I have a new product. It will make your life better. Use it and use a lot of it. There's a new commercial, well, it's not new anymore, but there's commercials out there now, like things like, wash your dishes every day in your dishwasher. Don't wait, do it every day. Cause you only use like a gallon of water. But every day you can use one of our dishwashing detergent pods and throw it into the environment. Uh, and this is the kind of stuff that happened when we developed this technological impulse. And so I put a few things up on the top of this slide. One was when in 1970, I'll refer to 1970 a few times, partly because I was a senior in high school and Richard Nixon was president. And in 1970, the atmospheric level of CO2 was 320 parts per million. And I looked up this today in December, for the month of December, it was 422 parts per million. That's a big change for something that only makes up 0.04% of the atmosphere. It used to be 0 0.03, now it's 0 0.04. Doesn't seem like a lot, but you know it's having an effect. So that's throwing off the entire carbon cycle. There's so much carbon we're putting in the atmosphere, this cycle can't handle it. It's overwhelmed. And so it just keeps building up in the atmosphere. <clears throat> During World War II, I think, or maybe World War I, Haber and Bosch developed this idea that we can take atmospheric nitrogen, use a lot of heat and a lot of pressure and some catalysts, and we can make ammonia, and we can fertilize the world with this. And so Haber-Bosch process was developed, and there's factories around that will then take fossil fuels and other um, things to get energy from, and they make nitrogen and throw that out into the environment. Today, 50% of the nitrogen in the human body comes from the Haber-Bosch reaction. Not sustainable. This is a real problem. So we've thrown the nitrogen cycle out of whack. There is algal blooms all over the place from our agricultural runoff and so on. <clears throat> Can you see the blue on the screen? So before we had satellites in space, if you did have a satellite and you look down on Earth, that's what the United States would look like. This blue map, that's the United States. <clears throat> so the Earth was dark. Whoops. Yeah, so the light, um, 1879 was when the first commercially available light bulb was put on the market. In 142 years, we've lit up the entire planet. It's pretty remarkable. So this is what it looks like from space now. This is, NASA takes these pictures all the time. Long Island, that's where I grew up. It's pretty bright. I could see the moon at night, sometimes Venus and Jupiter and stuff when I was a kid, but hardly anything else. I never saw the Milky Way until I moved away from Long Island. And we'll go, let's go over to here and we'll go to Michigan and you see um, Chicago, big bright spot. And you can see Minneapolis. And then you go over there underneath 142 and you're in South Dakota. What city is big enough? to produce that much light in South Dakota. There isn't one. That's fracking. This was not on those pictures in 2010. 
This is when fracking really became a thing in Minnesota. Those are all the lights from the fracking fields, both the lights so they could run 24 hours a day, plus the methane and gas burn off that they do. So yeah, we change things on the planet. We've kind of terraformed it to hell. <laughs> <clears throat> This is a snapshot of the real-time air traffic at 9 a.m. on January 5th. That's a lot of planes to be in the air all at once. If you look at the statistics for this, 8.6 billion people flew in 2023, and there's about 8 billion people on the planet. Doesn't make sense. Obviously, not everybody flies. The people that do fly, fly frequently way more frequently than the majority of the population. I'm say the majority of the population has probably never been in an airplane. That's something that wasn't there that long ago. We didn't have airplanes flying across the sky. And now if you go out and take photographs, which I like to do, it's really hard to take a photograph that includes the sky where you don't see a contrail going through it. You, you don't, it's really hard to find a day where you can go out and take pictures of actual clouds that are weather clouds as opposed to human induced clouds from the um, vapor coming out of airplanes. So this is that famous photograph that NASA put out when we went to the moon. And this is what they call it the blue marble. So this is the planet Earth. When I was five, Russia launched one satellite into space, Sputnik. It was in 1957. You can do the math. <laughs> How old have you been? I am retired. Um, <clears throat> I saw that. My neighbor worked at Brookhaven National Labs, and he knew all this stuff was going on. And he brought us out into the street that night when it was going to fly over. It only made, I think, maybe a couple of orbits or one day's worth of orbits or something. Anyway, he says, it's going to go right there. And, you know, we're all out there looking. All the parents were talking to each other and all the kids were playing games and I was looking and I saw it. And I said, hey, there it is. And Sputnik, the very first satellite that humans ever put into space. It's not that long ago. This is what's in space now. 64 years after Sputnik. I have to change that to 65. We just became a new year. Just realize. So this is the objects that are being tracked by the European Space Agency that are in space. Almost all of them are things that we put up there. They're not all functional satellites. There's a lot of satellites that are not functional. And there are a lot of debris from rocket engines left behind and all kinds of things. When they launch a satellite, half the time the rockets stay up there. They also get in orbit. And so we've not only polluted our own planets where we live and reside, we're doing it in space. We're totally changing the outside part of our environment. <clears throat> and I looked this up yesterday. It's pretty interesting. So the number of satellites going up, and we all know this because Elon Musk and, and SpaceX have been doing this, launching lots of satellites. So from uh, 2006 to 2022, this is the increase in the number of launches that are happening every year or a number of satellites that get up in the space. There's a lot of attempts at launches that don't work. So SpaceX now has 4,000 satellites circling the planet. And their plans are to have 30,000 satellites circling the planet. They currently have permission to put an additional 7,000, something a little over 7,000 into space. So I redrew their graph, well, I shrank their graph and I put in what 30,000 satellites is gonna look like on this plot. And I used 2030 because that's the year that our strategic plan for the university ends. We had a big strategic planning thing going on a couple of years ago and it was, to, it was the 2030 plan. And I'm gonna, you'll come, we'll come back to that. <laughs> so anyway, in 2030 maybe, um, depending how quickly you can launch these things, which are, is happening every week now, um, there'll be a, just satellites every place. There are at least three or four other companies that are proposing to do the same thing. And there are on record something like 400,000 satellites projected to be going into space if 
they get approved by NASA and the FCC and all that stuff. Imagine that. That cloud that I showed you from the ESA is going to get really dense. There are smaller satellites, but still, it's a lot of crap up there. Each rocket launch is estimated to produce at least 3,000 tons of carbon into the atmosphere. This was a number that was calculated by actual astronomers who are concerned about launching all these rockets, not just Elon Musk rockets, but even NASA rockets and stuff. <clears throat> so SpaceX, if you do the math, is on track to add about 9 billion tons of carbon to the atmosphere. SpaceX, of course, is owned by Elon Musk, who introduced us to electric vehicles with the promise that this is going to help us with our carbon problem. And then he's using all of his profits from all of his activities that are all dependent on using huge amounts of carbon to tell us that it's going to save the world. That's why he's planning to go to Mars. And he should. So in 1970, when I was a senior, and Richard Nixon was president. There was 320 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Today, it's 420 parts per million. Last year was the hottest year the planet has seen in 120,000 years. You can see the temperature is the red stuff. This is all increasing exponentially. It's all related to biology. You may not think so, but it is, because we are biological organisms, in spite of what I said. <clears throat> Other things are, in, everything's increasing exponentially if humans have anything to do with it. Our population went from about, you know, when I was in high school, it was 3.6 billion, I think. Um, now it's 8 billion. Global energy consumption always increases every year. It's been doing this ever since the Industrial Revolution. And our, what we call productivity increases every year exponentially also. They all track each other. It's all dependent on the energy. <clears throat> so back to the happy part of our ecosystem when it's working in harmony and sync, and it has this infinite loop capability where everything is transforming happily. All these electrons are zipping around in the biomass of life and establishing what we call our ecosystem and our planet and everything runs smoothly. <clears throat> and then humans appeared in there someplace, evolved out of transformations from one thing to another. And these humans came out, they had fire, they got bigger brains and they started to find other ways to get more energy and extract more things from the universe, everything, food, whatever, go out there and let's destroy an ecosystem and put in a cornfield. Let's go destroy another ecosystem and put in some soybeans or you know anything like that. So it keeps going on. We now live in the age of what I call <clears throat> the good old people ecosystem, which is basically this extreme ecosystem where everything we do depends on having a source of this, some form of energy that we're extracting from the earth. And we're using a lot of that energy actually to extract more out of it. If you've ever been to a coal mine and seen the trucks that they have, they're as big as this building. You know, we build those and it takes a huge amount of energy to make all this stuff. And it's just, there's a lot of things required of it. So we make stuff, we, companies make them, they, Amazon ships them around, the consumers get them. They do stuff with them, run our economy, and it all, all of it ends up in the landfill, pretty much. None of that stuff that we make, even though not all of it's made out of fossil fuels, all the plastic is, but um, there's other things we build and construct. They're not made out of fossil fuels necessarily. We, we use the fossil fuels to make them, but when we're done with them, we bury them in the ground someplace in a tightly sealed compartment where they'll last for maybe 20, 30,000 years without decomposing and re-entering back into the ecosystem. So what I said earlier was that all life forms on the planet 
do this cycle stuff. We all live in these cycles and we have to give things back to the planet. There's one organism on the planet that has violated that very essential rule of life for at least 150 years. We don't give things back to the environment. When I was in high school, I was a grave digger at a cemetery. Well, I worked at a cemetery and I dug graves and did other things too. But one of the first graves I dug, I was waiting for the boss to come and say it was done. And when he came, he goes, well, yeah, it's pretty much done. You got the right depth and all that, but we got to wait for the vault guy. And then this truck comes and there's a big concrete vault that goes down in there. And then the casket comes during the funeral and the casket gets put into this concrete vault, which has a lid that when it closes has tar around it and it seals. It's airtight, watertight, the coffins inside that airtight and watertight thing. And I said, well, why are they doing that? So there was like another $800 cost back in you know 1970 when I was doing that work. Very important work, digging holes in the ground. And um, <clears throat> he said, well, it's a, it's a health issue. So the funeral industry made it a health issue. They said, well, you know, these bodies in these caskets, you know, at the ground, you know, when it collapses and stuff, you know, diseases could get out. So they marketed it as a health issue. It's, it's not a health issue. It never was a health issue. It was for landscaping. It was for the visuals of the golf or the, not the golf um, course, the cemetery. And I knew this when I mowed because we spent a lot of time mowing lawns at the cemetery. The cemetery was very uneven because every place there was a grave that was old enough, the casket collapsed and the ground sank and you couldn't take those high speed motors that they were using on big open golf courses and go whipping through the cemetery. You get thrown off of the thing. So they made sure that the cemeteries are nice and flat so that they could mow easily. That was the only reason they did. Eventually they got sued and they had to now, now they tell you on the websites that this is a cosmetic thing. But it's pretty amazing. We don't recycle dog poop. If you walk a dog, there's a high probability that you pick that dog poop up in a plastic bag. You reach down to the ground and you grab that wet, gooey, smelly stuff and you pick it up and then you throw it in your trash. It goes in the landfill. Now that's fertilizer, pure and simple. And we put it away and seal it hermetically inside a landfill someplace. I did the math. I found out how many dogs there are in Bloomington and how much poop they generate. <clears throat> and we put about 10,000 pounds of dog shit into the landfill every week in Bloomington. That's making a lot of assumptions, unfortunately, because there's no hard numbers. They don't have dog licenses. They don't know exactly how many dogs there are. I had to average how much dog poop weighed, <laughs> how many times they go a day, that sort of thing. But anyway, it's a lot of dog poop that goes in the landfills. And even if you put it in a recycling bag, it's in that landfill for 10,000 to 15,000 years. This is a statistic, statistic that really stunned me when I found this. This is a paper in Nature. The amount of mass of human-made stuff. Read the legend over here. Surpass the amount of mass of all of the biomass on the planet in 2020. So we are creating stuff from the Earth that doesn't go back to the Earth at a rate that far surpasses the amount of biodiversity that's out there. That's a pretty scary number. <clears throat> so I wrote this. This is the, um, what, what the greedy old people want. They want us to have a consumer-driven economy that allows corporations to freely, with no responsibility, diminish our biodiversity, our environment, and the lives of others, so we, the greedy old people, can accumulate more wealth and power. So a lot of people talk about um, environmental justice. You know, those who have and those who don't. We all hear about the one percenters, the ones who have the vast majority of the wealth. The greedy old people have this philosophy that we cannot persist if we don't have a continuous growth economy. 
We have to have continuous growth. You're hearing it all the time now because there's elections coming. Everything is about the economy. It's always about the economy. We have to have growth. We have to have growth. That growth that goes to the 1%, it's like the leading edge of a slime mold that's growing out. You know, it leaves stuff behind as it grows to where there's more food and it leaves more and more behind as it grows out to where there's more food. That's the 1%. They're the head of the slime mold. <clears throat> so they're not only greedy, they're slimy old people. There's an author named Vinklis Smill, who he's a um, physicist who specializes in energy and doing lots of math about energy. And he wrote this book called How the World Really Works. And this is one of the most amazing things I saw in there. Human beings today enjoy on average the annual benefit of 34 gigajoules of energy expressed in units of human labor. That is as if 60 adults would be working nonstop day and night for each person on the planet. Not in my experience <laughs> is there 60 people doing stuff for me, but we don't think about it. The other, another number he has in his book is if you go to the Kroger's or whatever and you buy a tomato and you bring it home and you put it on your table and you look at it and you go, he would tell you it took three to four tablespoons of crude oil for that tomato to end up on your table. Every tomato out. <clears throat> So what happens if we do what we're doing? If we as biological organisms, not something else, who have been spending the last 150 years fighting tooth and nail to avoid biological reality by curing every single disease we can possibly cure, by making things that will make our lives much better, like disposable everything. I remember as a kid, when these commercials started, when I was like six or seven years old, use it once, throw it away. Everything started to go that way. And then, and then we had manufacturers making things with planned obsolescence so that you'd have to throw them in the garbage and get a new one. It just keeps going on and on cyber stuff is even scarier because we are now building this ecosystem that is electrified. We are storing every piece of information we gather, all those idiotic YouTube videos, TikTok videos, whatever it is, it's all being stored. To store something takes energy, to make it takes energy, to organize it takes energy, to access it takes energy. It's all entirely dependent on extreme high amounts of energy. Our military spends almost all of its energy resources protecting the shipping lanes for energy. It's doing it right now in the Red Sea. We've been doing this for years. The military requires energy. The military actually produces more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than most everything else. You never hear that talked about when we're talking about solar powering our cars and those kind of vehicles. I mean, it's pretty crazy. <clears throat> I'd say a little out of control. So when Maggie was asked to draw what might be happening to that infinite loop, this is kind of what she came up with, that we are extracting that infinite loop for stuff. We go out there and we take in whole ecosystems. We took the entire prairies of the United States. We killed off all the buffaloes. We took all those grasslands and we converted them to corn and soybeans. We didn't replace it with anything. We didn't return the corn and soybean biomass back to the planet. We just took it and we put in industrial produced nitrogen into that. And we go out and we mine potassium and phosphorus and bring that to those ecosystems. But we don't replace, we just take. So basically we do landfills. It's pretty frightening. So imagine down the road, what's gonna happen? Now, we're not here yet, but we're really close. <clears throat> uh, 1970, Nixon in his State of the Union address said, the great question of the 1970s, shall we surrender to our surroundings or shall we make our peace with nature? 
and begin to make reparations for the damage we have done to our air, to our land, and to our water. Many may not know this, but Richard Nixon started the EPA, the Clean Water Act, and a bunch of other environmental legislations that our last administration, not our current, but the previous one, was trying again, hampered by trying to get rid of all those regulations. But since 1970, bird populations in North America have declined by 3 billion. In Germany, they saw that about 70%, a 75% loss in biomass of flying insects. Um, 150 to 200 species of frogs have gone extinct. 41% of all amphibians are in decline. A quarter of the world's freshwater fishes are at risk of, extinct, risk of extinction. And it just goes on and on. I mean, every day, if you look in the New York Times, you look in the Washington Post, you look in any actual newspaper that does reporting and investigative work, you will see headlines that have all these things in there. This poster is from Earth Day in 1970, when I was a senior in high school, written or drawn by Walt Kelly, who had this famous cartoon, Pogo. And basically, we have met the enemy, and he is us, the only organism on the planet that is trying so hard to not be biological. But we know we are because we're biologists. We know that. And yet, all of us are doing the same sort of things. It's really hard not to stop this process. I don't see how we can, to be honest. <clears throat> this was in the New York Times last week. This is a plot generated by people who study population growth. And it says up there that the um, fertility rate in the United States is about 1.6 right now, which is lower than it is for replacement. So our population is slowly starting to shrink. Other places in the world is also starting to shrink, but there's a lot of places where it's actually really high. And so the population is continuing to grow. And the predictions are that it's going to peak out at about 10 billion people at some point here. They say 19 85 or 2085. So this is based on modeling that they do. I don't know how they do that, but they do it. <clears throat> so 1970, probably around here on this, I they didn't have a legend. <laughs> the axes weren't labeled, so I don't know. So I had to sort of measure things. Um, but anyway, so somewhere's in here. So around 2 billion people, two, 2 to 3 billion people in 1970, or uh, 3 billion. Um, there's this thing when the Haber-Bosch reaction came about. There was also a lot of other technological innovations that humans were doing, building mach farm machinery, equipment, doing all this stuff. And one of the things about this nitrogen fertilizer is when you dumped it on the corn and the wheat and the rice crops that were available at the time, they grew really tall. It fed them and they use it to get tall. And then they'd fall over when there was a windstorm and you wouldn't be able to harvest the grain. So we were losing this, what the high yields that would have been generated by this extra nitrogen into the soil. And so this person named Norm Borlaug came up with the idea of breeding short versions of rice and wheat and corn. That way they could use that nitrogen to, to the grain and they wouldn't fall over in the storms. And when that happened, it was a confluence of his idea, the um, industrial production of fertilizer and the industrialization of the agricultural industry through machinery and equipment that all runs on fossil fuels, designing those things to harvest crops and so on, that led to a doubling of the population in just a few dozen years. And Norm Borlaug said, after he accepted his Nobel Prize for the Green Revolution that he sort of spurred on with these short plants, that we're just putting off the inevitable because at the time, there are millions of people starving on the planet. And this was the solution. Make more food. It worked. Starvation rates went down. Now, there are many millions of people starving on the planet, just as Norm Borlaug predicted. We're in a much dire situation than we ever were. Um, the People have been saying for years that the plant community needs to work to double crop productivity by 2050 as we approach this 10 billion mark. Otherwise, we're going to have even more severe starvation. Of course, the amount of research dollars going into plant research has not increased since, say, 1950. 
it all goes into biomedical research. 98% of the research dollars spent by the federal government goes into biomedical research, which is basically how do you keep that population growing? Because the people that do economy are really worried about our low fertility rate in this country because it's going to hurt the economy because you can't have a growing economy that's based on that consumerism GOP kind of thing where you just take it and throw it in the landfill and give them the money. So I don't know how they did this decline. Uh, the article didn't have a lot of detail in it, but they predict that about 2085 when we reach about 10 billion, it's gonna start to decline. It's gonna decline precipitously. So the dark red line is if the entire world had the population, the fertility rate that we have, 1.66, it's gonna drop like that. And it's gonna take about 300 years, 10 generations. going to be some sort of natural selection during this event, no matter what you think. We've avoided natural selection for 150 million years, at least, maybe a lot longer than that, because fire was discovered a long time ago. And we're going to be confronted with that in our future. I won't. My friend Tom Kaufman won't. But some of you will, especially as students. <clears throat> so what if there's some other thing that causes an uncoupling between what we do today and what we can do in the future? Now, uncoupling events are things like, you've probably heard of uncouplers in biology. Um, chloroplasts and mitochondria have this energy they build up inside their space, the proton gradients and electrochemical gradients and so on. And if you puncture the hole or puncture the membrane, this stuff just dissipates. You no longer have that gradient that you can use to do any work, but all the systems are still trying to crank out energy and do it. It's just futile and you die. So what kind of events might do that? Collapse of our economic system. That could happen anytime. I mean, we made it up. We have no control over it. It's like totally nuts. When you talk to economists, they can't explain it to you. It's just like that. And then yet they get Nobel prizes. It's amazing. So what if there's an uncoupling event? So I picked 2030 because that's our um, strategic plan goes to 2030. They had this plan for 2030. And the plan for us between now and 2030 is for the university to get their hands on more money so we can do stuff. And that more money is going to come from the researchers. We're going to have now have two grants or maybe three grants to keep the system going. But what if the economy collapses or we have, you know, a solar flare that fries the internet or something like that. I mean, it, it doesn't take much. You know, those phones we're carrying around. I didn't have one when I was digging graves in the cemetery and I got by. Now I'd have a really hard time if I lost that ability to have access to that amount of stuff. It would be very hard. <clears throat> so if that happened, we would have an uncoupling event. It would be like adding detergent to your mitochondria or your chloroplast, the membrane would just, and no energy would be usable anymore because you have to have it contained to do the work. So we would have maybe in 2030, a collapse of everything. How are we preparing our students for this? Do we even talk to our students about this? When you're teaching, do you talk about this stuff to your students? It's really hard to do this. I, I'm having a very hard time right now. But how do we do that? It's pretty serious. <clears throat> Maybe it won't be 2030, but I'm bet you. I bet my life <laughs> that it will be before 2085. I don't think we'll make it to 2085 without something really serious happening. It's already happening. You, know, you can see it if you read the newspapers and pay attention to what's going on, the wars that are happening all over the planet. We only hear about a couple of them, but there are wars happening all over the place. There's rebel people, individuals, uh, groups going around just raiding places and so on. <clears throat> so this is what I see their future looking like. I think Maggie had it right when I discussed this with her and she came up with this picture. It's bleak. We're biologists. We know we're violating these rules. Well, you do now. Maybe you didn't when you came in this room, but now you do. And you know how basic and fundamental the level is at which we're doing it. 
And I'm pretty certain that when you leave this room, you will continue to break those rules. And you will want some of those rules to be breaking and will be seduced into buying disposable things and seduced into continuing this idea we have of this continuous growth. Any biologist learns really early on that continuous growth is not a possibility. 